We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. This is a pre-recording of a Twitter Spaces live event that we hosted earlier last week. Uh, it's going to be chopped up and released in a couple different pieces because our conversation ended up going uh, just over five hours. Um, we had the conversation on Friday, April 8th. If you'd like to be a part of the next one that we're going to be holding on Tuesday, April 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, go on to Twitter slash Palisades Radio, and you can be part of the conversation. You can listen to our conversation on the desktop, but it works better on the mobile app because then you can actually um, log in and ask us questions and interact with us as well. Just as a reminder, as always, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you want to listen to it, as well as Odyssey if you don't enjoy using YouTube. We were joined in this call by Bob Coleman, Tom Luongo, David Morgan, the Happy Hawaiian, and even Steve Penny for a little bit. I hope you enjoy it and hope to see you on the next one. And again, we uh, we appreciate everybody's patience here. This is a, a new thing we're going to try out, and I appreciate the uh, the suggestion, Bob, um, to be able to kind of have a more a more interactive discussion here with with everyone. So, um, looking forward to to hearing some of your questions and actually getting to interact a little bit more in a in a live way here yeah definitely uh, yeah because i'm hoping that we can get uh, the nice thing about these spaces is sometimes you'll have yeah people will just kind of float around and they'll they'll see it on uh the top of their screen they'll they'll enter into the to the room and you know you, you tend to get uh, professionals as well as uh, investors just looking to learn but uh, you can get into some pretty good discussions i think the one we i did a couple weeks ago went about three and a half hours uh, you know, you just, it takes you down rabbit holes, but it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit raw, but at the same time, um, I think, uh, it's a great way for everyone to kind of, uh, bounce ideas off each other and trying to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's something that, um, I think with, I, I would say there was as a challenge with doing the podcast is trying to present all these different ideas and be able to entertain like think about them and figure out what are the merits of each, you know, you, you can have two opposing sides of the argument and try and figure out which one is more likely to happen, let's say, um, by being able to debate those, those ideas. Right. Yeah, definitely. So Bob, I know, uh, this, this originally started by you and I kind of having a discussion around premiums. Um, especially in the last, let's say, month and a half, two months since the, the trucker protest. Let's say it kind of started with that. Um, and then the, the war as well. Um, that has really kicked up demand, it seems. And I know for myself, I have never gotten so many, um, you know, r- real contacts of people asking me, how do I actually buy physical metal? So how, how do you see, um, I I know you've had a couple discussions in the past week of where premiums are going and and why they react the way they do in, in high times of demand like this. So how do you see the, how do you see the premium, um, kind of debate and the, the reaction to the demand like this from, the the producers basically yeah it, it, it definitely there's a lot of um, debate going on there's a lot of language that's thrown around i think by by uh, promoters and dealers and industry uh experts and so forth and it, it i think it gets very confusing very quickly uh there's a lot of inferences about you know just shortages of silver and you know the price of silver should be where the silver eagles are trading at and and um, so there's a, there's a lot of, uh, um, I kind of call it noise. Uh, you kind of have to go backwards in time a little bit. Uh, you, 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 over the, 
you know, when 2013 happened uh, and the market kind of fell out of bed, um, we went into sort of a bear market uh, in the in the metals uh, world, and then yeah, you know, 2000, I think 18, 19, you had uh, a couple big players leave the market. You had uh, Republic Metals uh, have uh, problems, and then you also had NTR and Ohio Precious Metals, which were two big uh, uh, refiners that were that were putting a lot of retail product. Uh, they went bankrupt because of the illegally mined gold situation out of South America and the money laundering and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that kind of took some players out of the market. And just to get into this business, there's a lot of capital expenditures that, that need to uh, be applied, you know, machinery and, and, and so forth. And so basically when COVID hit, um, you know, the, the metal scene was rather dead up until COVID. And in, in March of 2020, everything just kind of broke apart and was positive for the metals, but the industry wasn't prepared for that. So you had basically this big wave of demand come in at a time when, you know, the production facilities just, they weren't able to ramp up. I mean, there was some above, there was a lot of inventory overhang, but that kind of went through the market pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, the issue you've run in the last couple of years is it just, it's not profitable um, or it, it, just very, um, it, there's not a lot of foresight in terms of uh, trying to create a plan, buy a lot of machinery, uh, and go into business of making you know, blanks or, or whatever it may be. Uh, because one, Bob, sorry, labor can you done. can you just adjust your mic to where you were before? Kind of oh, okay, got muffled sorry. again. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, just let me know because it's. Sometimes it's uh, you're you're on your phone and and the, the way these things work with Wi-Fi and everything you, you kind of start to hear a computerized voice. Um, but basically, um, when there just wasn't the ability to to increase output, um, you know, social distancing kind of came into play, and then all of a sudden these refiners were short-handed, and then they, you know they're you know they may have run on a production schedule, but it may be in half of what they were able to to output. So that kind of affected the market. It just made it really difficult to start building another plant. Uh, so you just have basically where you're at today in terms of, you know, typical production capacity, and you just have a steady demand for for, for retail product. Um, the the way the 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 structural imbalance, the way the wholesalers are looking at this market, is as these as the the, the delivery delays start to back out. Further and further, um, they're raising their premiums. Uh, one because of visibility, um, but two, they raise their premiums not only on the offer side, but they raise their premiums on the bid side to attract selling. Um, and that 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 starts to enter a different world for the retail investor that says, "My God, that you know, not only are there." In 2020, it was the retail dealers that led the charge and jam premiums higher. Um, and made an absolute killing. Um, and then 2021, you kind of saw the same thing, but then the wholesalers decided, okay, it's time for me to play in that game. And uh, they were they had pricing power, so they went ahead and, and started to, to increase premiums. Um, the Where you're at today is these premiums are rising on the wholesale level to try and, I think they're, 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 they're hiking them to try and raise selling uh, uh, of metal back to them and nobody's selling. And so, um, but, but the industry is a little bit broken here because as to, to kind of go back to, you know, the old adage was, you know, when premiums get high in coins, you could basically sell your coins and, and buy thousand ounce bars or hundred ounce bars and you pocket the difference in, in the, in the premium, um, uh, uh, spread that you get for selling eagles and buying bars. The problem with that scenario in today's world is since in 2017, the Trump uh, Tax Act that, that took hold removed the 1031 exchange option for precious metals. So you can only really uh, 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 do a swap, a tax-free swap, uh, and carry the cost basis in the new in the new product in real estate only. So when that went into play, that killed any motive 
to try and swap out of Eagles at $9 over spot or $8 or wherever these things are trading at and buy a thousand ounce bars. Um, that has created a, um, that, and it was unknown at the time, but it's created this second tier effect that's not allowing retail product to maybe take advantage of these high premiums and go into lower lower premium product like we saw prior to 2017. Uh, a great example, 2008, 2009 uh, timeframe, you saw that happen where you had delivery times in 2009 that were backed out to 16 weeks. I mean, it was four months uh, before you could get any product, whether it be uh, um, yeah, 100 ounce bars, coins, rounds, anything. Uh, and that's when people started going to buying thousand ounce bars uh, because the premiums were a lot closer to spot uh, and uh, you didn't have those wait times. Well, you, you don't have the incentive to do that anymore. So that's that's the thing I think that a lot of people don't realize. It's yes, there's there's tightness in the market and there's the pr problem making enough blanks out there. But it's it's not necessarily that they, they can't find the silver. It's just it just can't make enough blanks. Um, and enough product, and that's that's what's causing. It's more of a time issue than it is a shortage issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so, wholesalers only want to go out when they when they're selling product. They may only go out to six weeks of visibility in terms of being short product uh, before saying, "Listen, enough's enough. We're not going to take any more orders, or we're going to raise premiums high enough that we're going to try and stifle demand to slow the slow that freight train down." And, and so that's you're, you're kind of seeing that in today's world right now. Um, the, 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 what you tend to get, though, the retail investor, what they're hearing um, is that there's a shortage of metal. You can't find the product. It's about, you know, the trains leaving the station. If you want to buy it, you got to buy it right now. And that's not necessarily the case. It's just I think there's, there's the industry needs to do a better job of self-regulation, I guess you could call it, or compliance where it's, where you're not, I kind of call it fear mongering. You're not really jamming premiums mm -hmm. up and then creating the storyline that just says, uh, we can't find it. It takes, you know, three months for us to buy it. It takes, you know, or, or, you know, we're lucky if we can even get this stuff. Um, and you're lucky if you can even find it. So therefore you got to buy it to, at us at, you know, umpteen dollars over, over spot. I mean, it, it, to me, $15 over spot for Silver Eagles, it's very difficult pill to swallow because from a from a from an investment advisory standpoint, because I I look at this business more as an as an investment advisor than I do a dealer, and it's a very difficult thing unless you're seeing silver go to two hundred dollars an ounce, and at that point, who cares? But uh, you know, for, for the normal investor, um, uh, you know that says, hey, listen, if silver goes to fifty bucks or sixty bucks, you know I may sell some. Well, if you're paying fifteen dollars over spot and then silver goes to sixty bucks. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of secondary selling coming back onto the market, and that's going to kill premiums. Um, uh, it, that's we just are not seeing secondary selling right now, and that's why the premiums are so high. And that's I try to to, to, to counsel people and advise them. You know, that's something to consider once this market starts to move. It, not to say the secondary selling is going to kill the price of silver. It won't really probably affect the price as much. But it'll affect a premium, and that's the other side of the coin. Uh, no pun intended. Um, when valuing uh, your your product, uh, so that's those are things to to kind of consider, and hopefully that gives a little bit of sort of color on uh, the, the premium structure. Um, you know, what I try to do w with clients is is just try to find the best price product, you know, at the lowest premium, and just it just not have a go-to product all the time. So if it's, if it's hundred ounce bars and, and that, you know, I'm selling those at 265 over spot and that's able to get people in at a decent price and they can participate. If silver goes to 40 bucks, they can make some money at this or 50 bucks, whatever it may be. That's what's important. Um, uh, it, you know, selling these things, uh, cause my concern is that you're going to see premiums probably come down once you, once you hit that, sort of price level because you got to remember 2011 12 13 uh there was a lot of metal bought back then um uh and that there's a lot of overhang uh that, that's sitting above the market at least on the on retail product side um the 
the, you know, the, the, the new investor that's coming into the market, the, the beautiful thing that we're seeing now is you're seeing a lot of new people coming into this market saying, I'm trying to protect myself at this point, right? You know, I'm worried about the financial system or I'm worried about inflation or, or uh, counterparty risk or some of these other issues. Uh, and that's actually a great thing for the industry. I just want to see the industry um, not price those people out of the market because I, talking to people last year, a lot of people were very they got disgusted by how much the premiums were and just turned them off. They just, they stopped buying metal, you know, they, to them, uh, you know, they see, you know, an ETF or some type of fund as, as an alternative, at least, you know, they're, they're not trying to make up the premium. Um, uh, so, 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 so hopefully, you know, the industry kind of uh, sees this as an opportunity to, you know, I mean, it's it's wishful thinking, but and I have some ideas on how the industry could actually do a lot better job and and actually make a much more transparent market. It's just the problem is it's going to kill the that dealer based system um, and their spreads, uh, and that's you know eventually it's going to come just like the the internet did to stock trading back in the '90s. I think you're going to see potentially the same thing happen eventually in, in in the gold and silver market, and I think it'll be a good thing. I think we need some type of regulation um, to stop all these sort of practices that are taking money out of the pockets of investors. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, when we hear you know the idea that or the the argument that is made that when demand is super high that premiums will be paid on top of metal that you're selling back do you do you see that as a as a realistic you know scenario what what's that um, let's say dealers paying a premium to you if you're selling metal back to them when demand is is very high yeah, I mean, some dealers will. It it just depends. That's the problem with the industry. Some dealers may have a decent price on the on on the bid side. Um, you saw that a lot um, in 2021. Uh, you could almost go back to 2020, and this was a popular model uh, for dealers back then. Is that in 2020 when COVID hit, the industry basically was like a 90-10 split or maybe 95-5 split. Maybe 100% of the transactions that came into the market, 90 to 95% of them were all buying. Nobody was selling. And what the, what the dealers did, um, what I kind of saw was they put these really high bids in to support these really high offer prices to justify, hey, listen, I'm willing to buy this back at, uh, you know, way over spot. Um, uh, so therefore I can justify selling, you know, this product at even a higher price. And they knew that very few people were going to hit that bid because nobody was selling. I mean, it got to a point where I had clients that were buying, they could buy from me and sell it back to the dealer risk-free. <laughs> I mean, I was selling it below their bid. I um, mean, that's how ridiculous the market was. Um, uh, and, and, and so, yeah, I, I, I think right now what the problem I see in the, in the, in the industry is that you have a lot of structured programs that have gravitated a lot of assets over the, over the years. And all of a sudden, um, you know, people, once they start to turn the other way and say, listen, the price is up. I want to take some profits on some metal. I think these programs and these dealers aren't going to have the balance sheet uh, or the ability to maintain a very stable bid um, once that once that faucet starts getting turned on on the other direction, um, and I'm already seeing it. I mean, there, there's there's places in Singapore that the bids for metals uh, is horrible, um, but you don't have a choice because if you want to take delivery of it and bring it back to the U.S., it's going to cost you you know one two three dollars an ounce to bring that metal back. So you you either sell it for a dollar under spot. Uh, over there, or you, you pay to, to deliver it back here. And a, a lot of people don't understand uh, the, the risks that some of these structured and closed loop products um, uh, have. And, and that's what, again, this is why I keep telling people, you know, read your agreement and so forth. But, but that, this is, this is something that um, you almost need some type of national exchange uh, to create a bid offer sort of transparent, market 
where people, you know, can can deliver metal to regional uh, custodians or clearing firms or, or uh, depositories, you know, to verify and so forth. But then that metal can be put on to the exchange to be sold. And it, that's what we need to do in our world. Uh, and that would clean up a lot of these massive spreads and, and markups and so forth. Um, but it would be the best thing for the consumer. Uh, uh, yes, so people kind of say, well, God, that, that means the government's going to get involved and you, know, that, you, know, you mix government and gold together. It's like oil and water, but uh, somehow the, the public needs to have better price transparency um, uh, just just from a, uh, uh, you know, just, just so they can get a decent, you know, they have a chance of making some money on this. Because there's a lot of dealers, I've seen the, the horror stories out there where these guys have charged, you know, massive premiums. I mean, you see the news items, um, you know, 100% premiums on bullion products or 50% premiums on bullion products, uh, you know. Uh, preying on certain types of, uh, of investors and so forth. It, yeah, there's just that's the stigma that the metals industry sort of has, and it's it's trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, there's there's always an argument against, let's say, centralization of something like that, especially for for the metals, right? I mean, thinking about a discussion I've had with Jeff Christian. The, the whole idea behind wanting to buy, let's say, gold or silver is that if you want to, you can keep it a lot more, um, let's say, secret and protect that transaction in some ways. So, I mean, I, I see what you're I, I see your point of if you had a more central system, you could kind of you could create a more fair bid and ask um type market for for the bullion but uh, yeah I, I guess it always just depends on um what i guess what the um goals are of the person wanting to to buy from there and then and then what the the legality and or rules around that would would end up being right yeah, I mean, I mean, the exchange, I mean, you can look at the Shanghai exchange or you can look at, the, you know, physical type exchanges. You know, they do work in an orderly fashion. The the issue you run into, um, like the COMEX, the COMEX structure is actually a really good structure. I mean, there's audit there, there even though I know it gets a lot of flack and there's, a, you know, it, it's a derivatives market. It's but the 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 rules around it. Um, that the, at least the baseline structure is there is organization, there's rules, and and you know there's clearing firm, there's there's eyeballs, multiple eyeballs on the same metal, there's multiple eyeballs watching each each other, um, and so that it does have it does serve a purpose. You know the question is, you know, the COMEX itself was designed as a seller's market. I mean it's it's a hedging market. That that was the primary purpose. Um, and that's the that's the difficulty that physical uh, buyers have with a market that's really designed to be the hedging side of the business, not necessarily the the price discovery side of the business. And 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 that's that's unfortunate because obviously we all look at the COMEX prices to determine where the price of metals are going, or or at least you know in terms of what we're buying and selling. Um, so there's a lot of influence there, but. But you can create you can create a an avenue. Um, it would take obviously some you know some some players with some deep pockets. You know, I'm sure te the tech industry would probably make a fortune on something like this because a lot of it is more. Um, it ju it's just like you know like a stock exchange, except this way you have just physical metal and you can't really short stuff that you don't have on account. Uh, it, 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 it's more of a pure market rather than, uh, you know, a, a paper market that you can go in and just, um, uh, you know, short with impunity um, or, 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 you know, hit stops and that type of thing without really the idea of taking delivery. So um, there's some benefits that could be created from this. And it's something I've actually brought to the industry for like the last three years. And this is this hasn't been something new to me mm -hmm. uh, because I, I really come at this business. Yeah, originally I was I've been in I've been in the in the markets since 1992. Uh, started out with uh, Dean Witter and then Morgan Stanley, and then um, I started a, 
an independent advisory firm in 2001. I, I uh, started a hedge fund at the same time. Uh, and then my depository business, I, I, I started that in 2008. So I, I, I have You're a You're muffled again, Bob. Oh, sorry about that. Is that. Am I better there? Yeah. Okay. Did, did you hear, what did you hear last, I guess? Um, when you when you started your depository business. Okay. Yeah, so, so 2008, I started the depository side. 2009, I, started, yeah, I made relationships with wholesalers um, uh, t- to provide, you know, a, 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 a deeper market for, for clients and that type of thing. Um, so I come at this business more from the regulatory world uh, and compliance world that I'm kind of used to than the dealer world, which is uh, you, you can kind of you have more luxury of saying what you think. Uh, you know, you can speculate and call it, you know, information or, uh, you know, you know, knowledge or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it makes it t- to me, that's where I think sort of the professional side, the, the, ind- the industry side, uh, they're more limited on what they can say. And so it, it, yeah, you know, you, you, it's hard to rebut rebut some of these these uh, you know some of these accusations or speculations that's in the market. But you know, when you start to understand the industry, you can kind of reason through why things happen the way they do. Um, and that's why that's one of the reasons why I got on Twitter. Try to do I put out a lot of little pieces of, of research and so forth to try and help educate people, you know, about the COMEX, you know, the operations of it, you know, what it's really designed to do, that type of thing. It just helps people kind of understand the markets a little bit more. I mean, it's the London market is so much more opaque mm-hmm. uh, than, than the Comex is. Um, well, I, I see, I do see we, that we have Jim Hunter uh, listening. I sent him an invite um, to to become a speaker, <clears throat> so maybe he'll he'll join us here. But I, I've done an interview before with him, and he's a, a Comex trader, futures trader. So. Um, maybe he can help help shed some light on this and address some of the, you know, the, the misconceptions that we hear about the COMEX often. Um, another kind of topic that, that you and I were going to talk about, Bob, was the, the amount of derivatives that are, that are around the, the physical gold and silver that are actually in the investable gold and silver above ground in the world. So, you know, you you did some digging this week on that. So, what were some of the, let's say, your your takeaways from those conversations that you had? Yeah, the on the derivative side, I, yeah, there was a. I mean, I, I think Ted Butler put out some research pieces on the derivatives, the and, and he's he's absolutely spot on. I mean, that the the reports he's referring to the office of, uh, office of controller of currency reports. I mean, they they measure. The banks report derivative activity uh, and notional contract value uh, uh, in their um, quarterly reports, um, and that's reported. That's that's disseminated publicly, and I think he kind of saw this buildup uh, kind of taking place. Um, he tra- he he pointed out, you know, this this massive eight hundred million dollar book of Bank of America. Uh, two years ago to growing to 27 billion uh, today. And so I think his inference was that there's either some type of leasing or short position that's been built up over those two years. And that kind of caught my eye. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, I, I, I find it very hard that they could short, you know, that's, you're talking a uh, billion ounces of metal at that point. And, 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 and in all honesty, it was not just silver. The, this category happened to be the white metal. So it was platinum, palladium and, and silver, but, but for simplicity purposes, um, uh, it was a massive amount of money. And so I started to do some digging and trying to understand what actually these derivatives are, what, what, what's the makeup of it. And I, I kind of put out a little bit of a research piece, um, I mean, it's there. There's some pretty crazy stuff that Wall Street puts out. Uh, uh, for example, Bank of America. You know, one of the the derivatives. If you want to kind of think of it this way, anyone who saw the movie The Big Short, uh, you know, when Michael Berry goes into Goldman Sachs and wants to buy these um, credit default swaps, you know, and, and Goldman Sachs is, you know, they're sitting there laughing at him and he's buying it up. Um, in those contracts, those are private, over-the-counter type of, of contracts. And when you buy these things, the issuer 
uh, in this instance is also the price setter. So, um, you know, so when the price, you know, he got frustrated because the markets are going down, yet the price uh, of the of the credit default swaps going in the other direction, it uh, didn't correlate. Uh, you know, there's obviously a little bit of um, uh, manipulation there, just a little bit. So, so in these derivative products uh, that Bank of America has put out, J.P. Morgan has put out, um, and I was able to pull some of these down off their sites. Um, I mean, this is what some of these things are called. I mean, one is the Bank of America. It's a contingent income buffered auto callable yield note. And it, it, it basically takes the, uh, it's linked to the least performing of the iShares Silver Trust SLV or the Vanek Gold Miners ETF uh, GDX. And, and they have these, these product structures that say, listen, if you buy this product, the first 20% of downside you have protection on. And then you, after that 20%, you have one to one dollar risk. And then, but on the upside, you have 80% upside participation and then you get a a yield on this note um of say five and a quarter percent or six and a quarter percent seven percent whatever it may be and so what happens is people institutions that want representation in the metal space um will buy these products that are structured by the banks but the banks have there's no metal that's really involved it's just hedged structure so they use options they'll use uh you know i don't know if they use futures uh some some do some may not uh, uh, they may use over-the-counter products efp type spreads exchange for physical uh spreads that type of thing but they'll use that type of those types of vehicles to actually fund the strategy but in reality, there's absolutely no metal involved. It's because in this instance, it's SLV and GDX that are the uh, that are the underlying uh, instruments that are determining the 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 the, the, the price setting me mechanism. Uh, and then on top of that, Bank of America is the price setter of the derivative contract that the person just bought. Uh, I mean, here's another one that'll blow your mind. This one was put out by J.P. Morgan, and it's called. You have to get this one. The uncapped contingent buffered return enhanced notes linked to the lesser performing of the Spiders Gold Trust uh, and the iShares Silver Trust. Um, <laughs> I mean, say that thing a you know, hundred times. But, but, the, <laughs> but these, these instruments are backed by the balance sheet of the bank, not anything else. And that's important to understand. They, now, they may have call options you know, that are protecting, uh, you know, that, that are that are playing the market so they can participate on the upside. Now, what could happen is some of these vehicles, uh, if the call option gets exercised and they have to buy the underlying, uh, you know, vehicle, for example, um, you know, that could cost them a lot of money. Uh, but but that's not the, the, the got to remember, these are all callable products, so they can be called in. Uh, at any time, you know, once the issuer feels like it's not to his advantage anymore to have the product out there paying interest. Um, but but that's 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 where part of these derivatives. Um, that's part of that 20 some odd billion dollars. Uh, it's a big business on Wall Street creating these specialized products and vehicles for institutions. The, the other side of the coin is sometimes they've created these indexes. And so. Uh, it allows um, uh, institutions to create uh, uh, investment strategies against a certain kind of index, um, the commodity index, whatever it may be. So, so there, there are derivative packages that are wrapped around those types of vehicles as well. Again, this may not have anything to do with, with the underlying metal. That's the frustration that I see in the industry is that there is probably more money thrown at these paper products than actually at the physical metal itself. And that's where it creates this sort of potential of an LME type of situation that all of a sudden, if, you know, something started to kind of a chain reaction started to happen where, you know, one counterparty may have had a lease out and they were supposed to, you know, they're, they're supposed to, you know, they're hedging that lease and they're, 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 they're neutralizing the price action, but all of a sudden they have to come up with metal uh, you know, or some, something to that effect, it creates a chain reaction structure within the system 
uh, that could start to hit all these paper instruments and create, uh, a, you know, sort of an avalanche type of thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's worth digging into there more, Bob. You're you're mentioning that the the LME, if it got called for physical, having to deliver physical, that could create a. Uh, uh, some type of a cascading effect, but that doesn't necessarily apply to the COMEX, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the COMEX is a little bit different vehicle uh, or a little bit different structure than the LME. I mean, LME, first of all, they're not a big, they're not big in the gold and silver. It's more of a base metals type of uh, exchange. And about, you know, when you look at the LME, um, 80% of the transactions that happen, for example, you know, with copper or, or some of these base metals are OTC transactions. And if only about 20% of those transactions are maybe transacted on the LME. But the LME is sort of like the COMEX. It's a price setting mechanism that's that's publicly disseminated. So it it, it, it provides transparency for these OTC transactions to, uh, or contracts to refer to. So um, and that's where. It, 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 this whole thing kind of it, it's a concentrated uh, uh, price mechanism. So, you know, if the price mechanism breaks, it creates a lot of arbitrage opportunities. It creates a lot of spread opportunities. You, you have, you know, you have um, uh, I mean, not only the exchange for physical, um, but you, but you have uh, uh, I mean, you have um, oh, God, uh uh, contract for differences, uh, you, you have CFDs, you have ETPs. I mean, you have all these types of types of products um, uh, that uh, will then have that second tier derivative effect. Um, and that, that, that's where it could get really compounded. And if the banks are on the wrong side of this stuff, or maybe they're, they're not on the wrong side, but their counterparties on the wrong side, like 2008 happened uh, at that point, um, instead of, paper uh, or potential the dollar losses uh, if they actually have the physical metal they may end, end up using that um, as as their uh, collateral um, but that's but, but that 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 creates another that's another effect uh, down the road I mean SLV is a big thing that a lot of people look at GLD is a, another thing people look at and it's not that the the, the ETFs have the metal in in the 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 there if they didn't it would be the greatest fraud in history and I, it'd be too easy to figure out but but the what the interaction that the authorized participants have with these ETFs that's really where a lot of the the hedging and a lot of the strategies that that get employed into the market that may have uh, price neutralization uh, or, or or other types of effects um, you know like for example. Uh, when banks were closing down their commodity desks, they may have been rolling their their business, uh, their trading business in gold and silver, for example, onto the equity side, taking that metal, depositing it into an ETF, let the ETF carry the holding costs, and then they're just trading shares and they're hedging the shares, not necessarily the physical metal anymore. Um, and you know, and so their their equity side of their business or the forex side of their trading business may have had deeper pockets enabled, and and you may have. You have more exchange-oriented type of, of of securities that you could actually use to hedge with, so you don't have as much over-the-counter or third-party exposure. Uh, but but th- that's th- that's where that's a world for the authorized participants. But that's where games can begin, where authorized participants could then lease metal, deliver it to the SLV, get the shares back. Uh, and then, you know, their, their thinking would be, okay, if the price comes down, they could take their shares, sell it back to the SLV, redeem the metal back and give the metal back to uh, whoever they, they may have leased from. Uh, and th- that could have been something that could have easily happened back in the silver squeeze in 2021, where you saw a massive amount of silver come onto the market. Um, and it was, or it was, it was logged in the next day magically. And then three or four days later, a lot of it left out of that same depository or in fact, the entire depository. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to sort of skin the cat. Yeah, absolutely. So Bob, maybe um, it's worth, I guess, explaining for some people that don't really understand what is the purpose of hedging uh, for, let's say a, um, a metals dealer when we're talking about the context of 
you know, using the COMEX for what it's designed for in some ways? Yeah, that's a great question because the, a lot of the, oh, you have the wholesalers that will use either London or they'll use, um, uh, or the COMEX, they'll actually hedge every time they do a transaction, they, they go into the markets and they, they hedge, uh, uh, for the for basically when they have to replenish their inventory, so they'll actually go in and, and, and create that hedge, so that, so they can basically replace inventory without the, without that uh, without pricing risk. Or if they're trying to hold inventory, uh, they they'll have that hedge in place. So if the market goes up or down, um, they may not have pricing risk. Uh, the only thing that they potentially could have is premium risk. And what we kind of saw. Um, uh, you know, the last couple of years is, you know, the premium started jumping and a lot, a lot of these dealers or wholesalers may not have been fully engaged uh, or hedged because premium risk is very difficult to hedge. The only way you can really hedge that is by, by moving the premiums up uh, in anticipation, anticipation of, you know, maybe product getting tighter and then delivery times uh, lagging out further and mint saying, Hey, listen, I thought we were going to deliver a hundred thousand coins to you, but now we we can only deliver 40,000. So then all of a sudden it puts the wholesaler in a little bit of a pinch and, and, and they've gone through that and they've experienced it. And that's why you see these premiums kind of jump a little bit because they're anticipating potentially where the, where the, the premium itself could actually uh, uh, be something that they have to account for. Um, but on the retail dealer side, uh, some retail dealers don't hedge. Some of them just buy product and they, they hold on to that inventory and wherever the market goes, it goes. Um, you know, they may have, they may feel that the metals are moving higher over time. So they're not as, as stressed. Um, and then you have other retail dealers that will go in, they'll buy product from a wholesaler uh, and then take it in as inventory. And then they'll short, you know, a futures contract uh, against that underlying physical position. So if the price jumps up or down, uh, at that point, they've locked in their their price. Now the question is just how much can they sell the product for over spot, um, and and so it, uh, that's primarily when dealers get it. Uh, that's sort of their their price activity. So I, I guess maybe we we need to simplify it a bit more, Bob. Like if if a dealer is trying to buy, let's say, a hundred thousand ounces of gold or silver they have to go protect themselves in a price or in the COMEX by buying a contract to protect themselves from a price fluctuation between the time that they buy that, you know, piece or, or contract of metal and the, the time that it gets actually gets delivered. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, typically like if you're buying metal from, let's say you, you buy metal from a wholesaler, that wholesaler, he hedges the transaction because he has to anticipate buying metal um, from the mint, but he can't actually put an order in with the mint until um, they know exactly how much metal they're actually getting in allocation, and then they buy that allocation. Uh, so they they anticipate you know potential price activity that way too. Um, uh, but, but that gets a little bit more complicated. I mean, if you just want to look at the sim the simplicity of it is. Just say you know when 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 a wholesaler takes an inventory position, um, in most instances on the wholesaler side, because you got to remember the reason why they hedge their in inventory is not because it, you know they're just simply running. That's the way they do their business. A lot of times they're borrowing on a line of credit, and the bank will require them to be price neutral, not to take that risk of hey, listen, if the, all of a sudden the price of metals fall your inventory just drops like a rock. You're not going to be able to pay back that loan. So a lot of these are, are basically requirements or covenants uh, in, as part of that line of credit that they receive. So it's, it's embedded in the industry uh, that it has to be done. Um, uh, and so, and so um, uh, that, and that's important to understand. Um, it's just that it, 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 you know, whenever they go into the COMEX and they start playing on the, you know, they start doing transactions, you know, whether it's hedging or whatnot, um, uh, it, you know, it can have some impact on the actual overall price of, of the metal itself. Um, I mean, I, it's funny because you hear dealers slamming the COMEX 
uh, retail dealers. And then all of a sudden they're coming out saying, well, we use the Comex to hedge our inventory. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. If you were slamming it in one regard and now you're using it to hedge your, your entire inventory, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, you're, you're kind of using marketing, uh, uh, to kind of say, Hey, listen, you need to buy physical metal, but you need to buy physical metal from me at my, at my prices. Um, that, that gets into a different story. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, yet the, it's, it's just important to understand the dynamics of why dealers and wholesalers hedge. And it's just, it's very similar with, with fabricators and refiners and mints and so forth. Um, you know, the, you know, the mint, the U S mint, you know, they'll, they'll just buy the metal, uh, and, and make the product, um, and then sell the product. Um, uh, but in terms of, um, uh, because basically with the U S mint, whatever product they sell, they have to replace with, with more metal. Um, so it's just a constant rolling over of inventory. Um, but, but yeah, so hopefully that kind of helps. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to move on to a couple of questions, Bob, for now? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, if you want to have, um, anyone kind of jump on to, uh, definitely. Yeah. I, anyone that wants to raise their hand, I think, uh, 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 Tom can kind of uh, bring up as a speaker. Uh, um, I, I I can't see myself as a host yet for some reason. It's I, I see the invite, but I can't seem to, to be able to get it uh, um, logged in as a host. So um, yeah, it's kind of it's odd here. I, I've sent invites to um, a couple different people to to speak, um, Jim and, and Tom Luongo, um, and then sent you. Uh, an invite to co-host, but uh, yeah, anybody that wants to jump in here, um, raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> and so maybe we'll let's, uh, we can start with the, the curious one had asked, Bob, the, the question I have is why are leveraged paper positions not limited to collateral in storage and why financial leverage ratios not enforced on bullion banks while they, while they are with other futures traded commodities on COMEX? Um, yeah, it, well, it depends on the, the COMEX, um, the, and Jim could probably talk a little bit about this. The, the COMEX is by nature a leveraged product. It, it, it's, you know, you, you trade it on margin. It's the whole reason, it's like the old adage going to the casino. Um, uh, yeah, they allow you if you want to take a marker out and you can bar, you, you can you know bet with the house's money. I mean, that's what the Comex basically or the clearing firm allows you to do is you know you can leverage a position to try and gain a better exposure uh, and you know on a better rate of return potentially. Um, the the what he it's unsure what he's referring to. I mean, if you look at unallocated uh, gold positions, for example. That banks were, were doing a lot of um, prior to Basel three in 2020. You, you've seen, uh, I think, a, a quite a bit of deleveraging actually unfolding in the industry. If you look at the open interest and trading volumes on the COMEX, they're way down from prior prior to COVID, uh, and you have a lot more metal that's been put on the exchange. So, it, in fact, I was just running some numbers uh, earlier to today. Um, See if I have that. Um, it, basically, on the, the leverage ratio, uh, let me just pull it real quick. Um, like back in 2015, uh, you had um, you know gold paper ounces of gold to physical ounces in the registered category. You had about a 300 to one leverage. Uh, you know, back in 2015, early 2016, there was, there was as low as, a, as only 76,000 ounces left in the COMEX on the gold. Um, you know, today you fast forward to today, uh, you have, uh, that, that ratio has gone from 300 to one down to three to one. I mean, it's, it's, and you have over 18 million ounces now that are on the exchange in the registered category. So you've had a massive deleveraging, which tells me the players, I think, have changed quite a bit. The, the collateralization process has maybe changed. You may have had banks getting out of the business. So therefore, 
uh, players are putting metal onto the exchange, uh, you know, from, from, from a collateral standpoint to maybe use those contracts uh, or, uh, or, 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 the, or the metal uh, as a cash flow mechanism, maybe to, to roll contracts or to play arbitrage between spreads, that type of thing, which, which banks may have done in the past. Um, but it's, it's, it's noticeable. And I think it's, it's an underlying theme that metal has been moving, physical metal has been taking a more dominant role in this market. Uh, and I, don't, I think the Basel three was sort of a, a shot across the bow. The, the banks, uh, you, know, the, you know, Basel three was basically to the banks, hey, listen, you got to start deleveraging your balance sheet because, you know, you know the market's going to get rockier or inflation's going to pick up. I mean, these guys aren't dumb. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, their policies are in place because they are the system. <laughs> So, so when they when they are doing things, it's very important to watch that, um, and I think that's important to understand. And that's what maybe one of the reasons why you see gold not as swayed as much, or silver, for example. You don't see these two dollar bombs on a Sunday night anymore because the market, the underlying market, uh, when the market drops like a rock, the physical players come into the market and they start buying. They actually create the bid in the market, and the shorts can't press they don't have the ability to press um, and then they start covering. And that's where you get this sort of, you know, this choppy trading range type of action. Um, whereas, you know, you know, 2013, for example, you know, when, when uh, you know, we were at, uh, you know, negative interest rates then, but then we were, we were going positive in interest rates. You had this dive bomb and the market could pull break. And part of that was a lot of people were on leverage um, uh, and, and, uh, and wound those contracts, uh uh, and same thing in 2008. You had, you just had a a major break um, uh, in uh, uh, in 2008 and uh, wipe out a lot of liquidity to the downside. Um, yeah, and that's one of the reasons why COVID. When COVID happened in March of 2020, you had that same impact on the leverage side. A lot of people got wiped out. But oddly, what ended up happening was the shorts that had that had contracts that needed to roll. Because all those long players got wiped out of the market when they went to go buy, there was really no one left to sell. Um, mm -hmm. uh, even though you know there's you know, contracts, there's a buyer and seller for every 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 transaction. There they was just more bias of short players in there than, than there were long players, and so when they went to go buy, uh, it, that that leverage worked in the opposite direction. Um, and and I think uh, uh, I think that's. Maybe one reason why you don't see as much buildup in 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 contracts uh, in today's world because the liquidity may just be sort of slowly uh, uh, moving away from uh, you know these derivative uh, type products. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just remind everybody that it seems to only be working on mobile um, on the app, so. We're kind of kind of getting it sorted out here a little bit more. I know uh, Yeet had a, a a question. He raised his hand and then disappeared. So, um, guys, just try try again, and we'll uh, hopefully get to everybody's questions. I think uh, Tom Tom is on now too. Tom Luongo. Yep, I'm here. How are you? I'm um, not bad. It's a it's a lovely evening here in Florida, North Florida. What's going on? Well. Uh, Pretty, uh, pretty grateful for you to to be joining us. Um, I know our last discussion was pretty interesting. Right. Is there anything um, that that you've heard here so far that you have questions on? Um, no, I've actually just been taking in everything that, that Bob's been saying because I haven't really kept my ear in this space for this the, the guts of it for a, a while now because I've had to focus on other aspects of the. The, the bigger picture. I obviously I, I spend mm -hmm. more time focusing on geopolitics than I do, you know, what's happening on the Comex on a, on a, or the the LBMA on a regular basis. So uh, I've just been fascinated by listening to, to Bob like kind of lay a lot of this stuff out. So mm -hmm. I've got I've got a, a question for you. You know, I like I've been listening to to a bunch of your podcasts as well, Tom. Mm -hmm. And um, I had I had a discussion earlier today, um, and. One of the the ideas that was presented was that um, it's this situation that we're seeing play out right now with Russia and a lot of the other countries that are kind of moving away from the SWIFT system. Mm -hmm. um, this guy's opinion was that it's not necessarily such a death blow for the U.S. dollar because 
any of these other currencies don't have really enough liquidity or demand, um, or let's say enough liquidity to be able to reasonably trade it. Um, right. Yeah. What do you what do you think that, about that? I think that's fair. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think this this is not a step function. I think I, I think too many of us in the space we, we we tend to look at this and go, oh my god, this 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 thing has changed. Therefore, everything has changed. Mm-hmm. And well, I, I think that's we, we tend to you know I, I think some of it is that we really like to you know hope that the system will change because we recognize how frankly unfair it all is. But mm-hmm. it's not going to be a, a step function. It's mm-hmm. going to be a slow process of building new markets, right? When when China offered up its first uh, oil futures contract, um, it was just a matter of was it, was there going to be any market take up for it, right? Mm-hmm. And we you know we saw an initial flurry of, of activity, and then eventually we you know we saw it make a market and and uh, and sustain that for any, for, for uh, and the same thing is happening, and obviously the 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 sheepy, uh, gold contract and whatnot. So I just think you have to realize that this is a process. That de-dollarization, as I mean, the Russians have been trying to de-dollarize for seven years. They've had a program mm-hmm. of de-dollarizing since the last ripple crisis in 2014, and they've only de-dollarized half of their trade. Mm-hmm. This is the Russians, and they've been the most aggressive at it. So this mm-hmm. is a, this is a, going to be a difficult process, um, and it's going to be a slow process. But as I think, as things unwind, well, then it, you know, and as things accelerate. Then the unwinding starts to accelerate. More tends to accelerate the unwindings of old systems. Well, then you know we may be you know we may see this begin to accelerate uh, very quickly. I think I think everybody's shocked, including the Russians, at how quickly the ruble has recovered once they announced that they were basically pegging the the gold to the ruble to gold, right? So that they had to come out today or yesterday and go, no, we're going to work with a negotiated price now. But that just it means that they have pricing leverage. <laughs> Like, so it's got, you know, from their perspective, it's kind of cool, right? So that's, that's what I just, I, I think we have to kind of disabuse ourselves with the notion that it's going to be a dramatic overnight shift. And unless somebody decides they want to declare open financial war and bust the system down, I don't see that that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and to your, to your point, Tom, I mm-hmm. mean, something that Bob and I have discussed many times, um, and especially on the show, you know, we saw, we saw it being in some ways reported that the, the Basel three um, deadlines and rule changes were going to be this, as, as you said, this real step function change right. for the markets. Mm-hmm. And if, if there's one thing that I personally have learned from, from my time hosting the show um, it's just that this is not there, there doesn't seem to be a real step change uh, right. type of event because this is such a complex market yes yeah I, I would agree with that as well and i also saw something recently didn't they push off the basel three reporting uh requirements for another year uh bob might be able to speak better to that i saw i saw a report on like it was march 22nd that the the, the europe and city of london both agreed to to push it off for yet again for another year mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think part of that was was uh, I think um, 2020. I think January first, 2023, or or, uh, or um, I don't know if it was this June or that. That to me, it wasn't as important because they didn't change any of the rules uh, in terms of allowances of allowing banks um, any type of of leeway in terms of activity. But the, the, what Basel three basically did was. Um, it's it's handicapped banks from doing these unallocated types of programs where on their balance sheet they have a, a depositor that say deposits a hundred bucks they want to buy a hundred dollars in metal uh, in the past the bank you know credits the the client a hundred dollars in metal but in reality all they're doing is giving them the, the the underlying trade is actually the bank's balance sheet not necessarily the metal. Uh, and so what Basel three did was said, Hey, listen, if you're going to do that, you're going to, you're going to have to pony up 85% of reserves, um, uh, to, to protect that position. So, uh, you don't have free reign anymore to leverage out, you know, that program. Um, and so once, and then, and then also Basel three, what it did was it, where banks were, were basically a client was trading with the bank and the bank was the counterparty. Basel three basically said to the banks, they now have to trade on these authorized exchanges 
Uh, and so you have to trade through the bank, not with the bank. So the bank isn't the counterparty anymore, per se. It's the exchange itself. And that's th th those are some interesting that those are those things haven't changed, even though they've delayed the the implementation of the rule in London. Um, but that's I think that's just a sign of the banks sort of leaving some of this business behind, um, uh, at least on the leverage side uh, to, to reduce that balance sheet exposure. Yeah, that makes sense, and I think that I think that's um, something that we, I think it's almost a, 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 a an anticipation of, a, 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 well, it is a structural change in the market. I think it's an anticipation that they don't want to be in this business of having to to uh, frankly liquefy the 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 entire financial system with paper gold and then be on the hook and then potentially be on the hook for it. So they're pushing that back off onto the exchanges, which is where it should be in the first place. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does make sense. But the, the problem is the exchanges are derivative products themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the COMEX, like, for example, with the COMEX, if you, if you buy a contract and you stand for delivery, you don't actually control the process. It's the short or the seller of, of, of the contract that actually uh, can initiate the, the the delivery process. Um, uh, yes, the, you know, at the end of the, the delivery month, uh, if you're staying for delivery, uh, you should be able to get the metal. Um, but it's it's not a cash and carry type of market. It's not designed to be that way. And so it 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 creates this odd relationship with the client and, and most of the most of the customers of banks and so forth. I mean, you got to remember a lot of these customers are, you know, the traditional miners and producers and things like that, that you know, they have underlying physical metal and they're just hedging their, their, their physical position, their underlying position. It's, it's the, since COVID happened, when you have these logistics break, that breakdowns and, and demand for metal um, kind of come in at these, at these sort of wins, it, you see the stress that gets put on the system in very short periods of time. Like I watch the, the exchange for physical premiums a lot because you can see when the market gets stressed and that exchange for physical premium rises, um, uh, somebody is either short trying to get out of their position or they don't want to deliver the metal or they may not have the metal to deliver. Um, but but it, it, you see that stress in the system. So, so you, And then typically you'll see price action sort of uh, uh, irrespective to that, to that type of stress. Um, so it, it, yeah, you're right though, that the markets are changing slowly in terms of dynamics. And that's what, that's one of the reasons why, why I get into this business, because to me, the money is moving to, and, and to, to stronger hands. I mean, you look at high net worth individuals and institutions that, you know, that are moving more towards physical metal. That's been a, for the last three or four years, that's been the theme um, uh, from a lot of uh, investors. They're not buying as much, paper products out there. Uh, you don't see the activity, the volume. I mean, you, you see, for example, um, in a lot of these trade numbers that come out and, and transaction reports, uh, there's metal that's, that's just not showing up in these transaction reports, but it's being taken off. It's, it's being taken delivery of, but it just doesn't show up in, in a lot of these uh, regulated reports. And so uh, I think you're seeing more more of that, and I think that has to do with public perception. I think it has to do with political policy, social policy, tax policy. You know, just you know, expansion of Fed balance sheets and central bank balance sheets. There's a lot of uncertainty. No one knows what this world's going to look like five years from now, and so their their thinking is, I'd rather have the removal of counterparty risk out of my portfolio and and physical metal. It just makes a lot more sense in that in, in that regard. And, and that's what we want to see in the industry more of. You want to see physical participation, not these, you know, these institutional products that are just spreads and, and options oriented type of uh, uh, um, strategies, I guess you could say, that really don't have any more meaning than just simply, you know, buying, you know, doing the same strategy on the S&P 500. Yeah. No, I, 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 we need to see more of that. In, I mean, if, if the market is moving to a more physical market, which we, you know, we always hope that it would, because we need to get this out of the system, and we need to, to see the that the physical gold and silver markets um, uh, reflect, you know, 
coordination of delivery and time, like what futures markets are supposed to, to do. I mean, there's always room for speculators in every market. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not one of those guys. But it just seems that this is this is this is done for political reasons more than it is done for anything else. And it's, you know, it's very clear that the central banks have their thumb on the scale here. So, you know, it's great to hear that, that that's, that we're, we're moving away from that. And I, I have to wonder whether, you know, who's, from my perspective, it's like, I've been watching this from like the 40,000 foot, the strategic level and asking, you know, who benefits? Cause that's all I ever do is who benefits mm-hmm. from Basel three versus who isn't, but who, who is disadvantaged by it. And then, and I'm thinking mostly now in terms of, you know, countries and economic blocks and all the rest of it. So that's, that's where I find this stuff fascinating. I think if you look at Basel three, um, you could sum it up as basically it's offloading risk onto the exchanges. Um, and that's what the banks want to do, it, especially mm-hmm. if we're getting into an environment of uncertainty. Nobody wants to be short in front of this freight train. Uh, right. uh, uh, and I agree with you there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it makes perfect sense. So, Bob, I, I sent you uh, a, a message on, on Twitter there. The, the happy Hawaiian, Hawaiian asked a question. He said, to me, it appears a clear relationship between banks covering their short positions in the summer of 2020 and a price surging on silver, you know, to, to the point that you just made. So he said, many, many say banks or JP Morgan have short positions fully offset by physical, so they aren't, quote unquote, really short. Uh, what would Bob say to this, the notion that banks' short positions are fully backed uh, by physical? Um, well, you have to go back to 2015, uh, 2014, 15, 16, 17, and the market got really dead. Um, and a lot of refiners were putting metal back onto the exchange at that point because it, nobody was buying metal. I mean, it was just a, everyone was like a complete depressed state of mind. Um, and that's when JP Morgan started building up an inventory, or at least I don't want to say JP Morgan because it's really their custodial account that's that you see these reports in. I mean, I, I don't know if actually JP Morgan owns all this metal, um, even even though they report it on their on on you know these these uh, uh, stock reports and so forth, warehouse reports. Um, but from what I kind of gathered, the banks don't necessarily speculate. They just all they do is they take spreads. Uh, th- that's where they make their money. They could care less if silver goes up a dollar or down a dollar. Uh, as if they're long physical, they're probably going to be short the futures contract, or they're going to probably have an option strategy to neutralize, uh, you know, the, the just the, the price risk itself. But they'll but they'll do it enough where they can make a few pennies or whatever it may be profit margin that they do it over and over and over. I think that's what actually goes on. Um, it's frustrating to watch because the problem is if they are long underlying physical and they short the futures contracts, it's just that our pro- – again, it goes back to the COMEX being – we look at it as a price discovery uh, uh, system, but in reality, it's really a seller's market or a hedging system. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what I think frustrates a lot of people – in my in our industry and a lot of it, retail investors a lot of physical investors because it it's getting your head wrapped around just the dynamic of why the exchange uh, uh um you know why it exists in the first place um now and of course you can go down some rabbit holes from there but i mean that's that's the basics of it, it, it you know, but but i think um th- that's why i keep pointing people to London and these ETFs because it's the ETF structure where you can have a lot more uh, influence in the markets um, uh, from the authorized participant activity, uh, you know, you know, whether they use uh, the, the, the inventory, the, the silver itself or the shares, uh, you know, using those shares and then <clears throat> lending those shares out, um, you know, to, to people who may want to short. I mean, there's so many different hypothecations that could take place over there. And a lot of it's over the counter. And uh, it's not like, you know, London is not set up like the COMEX. At least the COMEX, all the custodians have to report all their holdings. And not only that, they're audited once or at least at least once a year, but if not twice a year. And all the metals counted. Um, it's just the, it's, it's the, um, 
The problem with London is there the LBMA actually doesn't have any requirement for a vault to be audited. Yes, the the individual client storing metal at that depository can can have an audit done of their holdings, but I don't believe from everything I've read on the LBMA, there's absolutely nothing that I've seen that says each physical uh, uh, custodian actually has to have an audit done at the end of the year uh, um, uh, and 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 have that reported. That's that's one of the beauties of what the COMEX, at least from a, from a transparency standpoint, at least they do that. Um, uh, but, and of course, then you get into the esoterics of people, you know, saying, "Well, there's naked shorting that goes on, or there's there's you know." shadow contracts and things like that. I mean, it, it, you can go down a lot of different rabbit holes, but I think it's, it's, you know, the London market actually controls the physical price more so than the COMEX does. I, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, yeah, that's where a lot of the physical metal flows through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I know I've spent a hell of a lot of time trying to understand this and spent a lot of effort on the show to try and you know, get all sides of it. Um, Happy also said, as a percentage of open interest, their net short position went from 40% to 27% over two months, and the price doubled. Was that just a coincidence? Um, I, I, I guess you could kind of say that you, know, you probably had, um, I guess you'd have to look into that, I guess, because you'd have to see what the makeup was, um, uh, you know, whether they, whether they, we're selling physical metal into that price rise, um, uh, and then therefore their short interest was was falling because of that. Uh, it, it's I, I'd have to probably research that one a little bit um, mm -hmm. because again, for every for every action, there's a reaction um, in in sort of the banking world, uh, and that's a, a, that's that's the part that makes it tough because we're not you know we're not the fly on the wall in these trading rooms, so we really all we can do is kind of speculate a little bit. Mm -hmm. There was another question uh, from Zach that said, I have a theoretical question for these guys. What if a Sprott type group built a storage slash mint facility and offered free storage or cheap minting for all Northern Canadian metals producers and essentially try to choke out supply of the North where miners transportation is low land is cheap up North. And how much would a vault cost to build and regulate for a behemoth like Sprott? Well, I, I guess the thing you'd have to worry about is Trudeau at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's that. But don't they already own? Didn't they buy the Central Fund of Canada? Yeah, they they, they bought that. Um, Sprott, you can get into a rabbit hole, and it, and I know I get a lot of flack, uh, and I don't know if you want me to bring this up or not, or. Um, um, but but just to, before I do that, um, it, it's it's important to note that the Royal Canadian Mint, which stores a lot of this metal that Sprott and others have, it's not just Sprott, but it's a lot of others. The, the central the, the Royal Canadian Mint is a crown corporation, um, and therefore the, the the they can be privatized. I guess you could say is the word, and everything in there could basically be taken. Uh, and with a government facility. You don't have that recourse. You basically have an immunity clause that's basically inherent with most government facilities out there. You can't sue the government. Uh, you know, the, the state of Texas, they have a depository uh, that's built right into the contract. They have an immunity clause right, right there. So uh, it's important to understand where you're storing and the structure of the product and vehicle. Uh, yes, it's convenient to store it at the Royal Canadian Mint. They make great product. They have a lot of, they, you know, they have a huge facility. Um, but yeah, there's there's the trade off with convenience is security. Um, uh, and then of course, if you were to buy metal, if you were to basically build a facility up there, the question you run into after we just saw with COVID, what happens when these um, uh, borders are shut down because of this? you know, the COVID policy or whatever it may happen, you know, you know, martial law or emergency powers or anything of that nature, you can really disrupt and create force majeures all over the place uh, where basically a force majeure is where something's out of someone's control and they can't perform a delivery uh, of, of a product or, or um, service. Um, and so what happens at that point? Uh, what happens to the, to, the, to the investment or the equity position uh, that you're invested in? Tom, hey Jim. Oh, yeah, you know, I would just say like 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 everything. Um, political risk is the biggest risk we have, 
right? And uh, I, you know, whenever anybody has ever asked me, it's like, well, so what should I do in, in terms of buying metal? Like, I, I think you have to think about geographic risk. You know, and you have to, and you know, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't put my money in. I wouldn't build a vault in Canada if I were anybody today. I wouldn't build a vault in the United States. Um, you know, it's. I don't know where I wouldn't build a vault in Europe either. Like, it, it, it's a crazy environment at this point. And and uh, even though these are supposed to be the places where they're supposed to be the strongest rule of law, <laughs> and that doesn't seem to be seem to matter at this point. Uh, Trudeau well, just, you know, I so. was just going to say we 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 saw exactly how the laws are treated uh, when they suit the government, uh, whether whether they want to respect them or not. Right? Yeah. I mean, well, just what they did. What they did, to, what Trudeau did, when done to the Emergencies Act, was was uh, was nakedly tyrannical, and was definitely a, a dry run for what they would want to do in the future. So, I mean, look, FDR, you know, issued a gold compensation order, you know, what ninety years ago. Guess what? They could do it again here in the United States. I don't think they're going to. I don't think there's any reason to. But I, I, I you know, the vaulting at this point is. I, I just think it, it's it's a it's a dangerous game. And, uh, you know, if you're going to get into that, then you should always consider, well, okay, I'm, everything that's not in my hands, I don't own, And mm-hmm. that's the way I've always, that's the way I've always like looked at it. So, I mean, how hard would it be for somebody to build a vault? <clears throat> the question is whether or not somebody would, it's worth it to them to build a vault. Well, I, Bob, obviously you can, you can speak to that because mm-hmm. you, you operate a vault. Um, so how do you, how do you assess the risk of let's say nationalization or, you know, however you want to, to, to actually say that, um, what do you think that risk of, of confiscation is, um, from the, the federal government for, for what's held within your vault? Yeah, no, no, it's, I mean, it's a great question. I, I mean, just to give you a little preference, we are one of the largest private facilities in the country. So I, I, I got into this business. I analyzed it. I looked at every country out there. I looked at every program out there. Oddly enough, and I know uh, yeah, some may disagree, the United States technically is still one of the safest places to store metals. And it's not just because we're, I'm a U.S. citizen. I, you know, I, I'm here in Idaho and you know, we're gunned up you know, to the max and you know, it's a conservative state. Um, if you look at the, the policies that, that, that the, the U.S. has vis-a-vis other countries, there is no value-added tax uh, uh, on precious metals. There's no value added tax on the services of precious or storage fees of precious metals. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look, go back to, you know, the, the, um, the import duty fees, for example, bringing gold into this country, for example, um, that's the same rates that they were back in 19, I think 37. I mean, you could bring a billion dollars of gold into this country and it's only going to cost you 530 bucks, um, to do that. I mean, you don't have any other country that you can do that with. I mean, it, a lot. Well, I should say a lot of countries uh, have value added taxes, or they have fineness uh, uh, exemptions and things like that. But but you have you have a little bit. You have a much. Um, you have more uh, say privacy or asset asset rights uh, here in the U.S. than you do you know in other countries. I mean, the, the confiscation thing is gets well overblown. Interesting, the Bank Holiday Act 1933, most of the gold actually was turned in prior to the act actually even going into effect. A lot of people, when Roosevelt was was uh, was voted in, uh, you know, it was a sign of confidence, and uh, you know, pe- people actually did turn in a lot of, a lot of their metal. Um, and then actually, once the act went into place, I believe only about 15%. Uh, had depo- had turned in their metal after that, and I don't believe anybody ever went to jail. I think one person was may have been, may have been went to jail, but um, uh, was never fined. I think he went to court, and I think he ended up winning in court or something like that. But it was not it, it, nothing was ever really enforced with that whole order. And in fact, it wasn't really confiscation; it was nationalization because everybody was given twenty dollars uh, uh, for their coin, their one ounce coin. Uh, they were given par value. It's just that the government needed to inflate. And so they had to, they had to basically revalue the dollar against gold because we're on the gold standard. But you're right. In today's world, there's no need to do that because gold isn't part of the, the, the monetary system. And in fact, the thing I make, I make the point 
very clear is it's so much easier to confiscate a bank account. And we saw it with Canada. I mean, yeah. who went to go into somebody's house or, or put in an order and have the FBI or, 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 you know, whoever serve a warrant to try and take some metal from somebody? You know, it's just so much easier to go on to a brokerage account or bank account statement and, and click a button. Um, and that's yeah. a dangerous thing. Uh, it, you know, that, that part is, I think, what scares a lot of people. And you saw this mad rush when Trudeau did that, that's what really the, the, the ability to hamper someone's uh, transaction ability is, is, I think, more. We've never really seen that before. Um, yeah. Yes, there's been, been more and all that. But, but that's that's the part where the physical metals that that's the allure of physical metal, because you can uh, unlike Bitcoin, for example, or, or cryptocurrencies, you don't need nodes and you know you don't need confirmation of transactions and proof of work, all that kind of stuff. If a, if, a, if if your neighbor wants to mow your lawn and you have a silver coin, you can give them that coin. No one needs to confirm the transaction. I mean, it's it's oh. the most autonomous way to, and it's been <laughs> that way for five thousand years. Um, I, I and no argument there, Bob. I'm not going to argue with that. I, I, that's what I was arguing for originally. Is like, why would you buy a vault? when you can sort at your house because they're the, the likelihood of them coming to your house to take your stuff without any kind of registry of who's bought one, where, how and why and how much um, is, is minuscule. And I've been, you know, I've been telling people this privately for 20 years, like, don't worry about it. Like the person who's going to break into your house to steal your, uh, to steal anything is going to steal your computers and your televisions that they're not going to steal your gold coins because they're not even going to know what to do with them. Like, Especially if you, if you, don't show them off and and talk right. about how many like gold coins you have. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think a point that that I've often thought about around that as well is the idea that you, you know, or tell me tell me if this is you know crazy thinking. If the government really has to try to back that amount of debt with a little bit of metal, I, I feel like that amount of metal. Um, at that point in time is probably going to put such a little dent in that amount of debt that it's, it's not going to be very right. um, worth it for them to, to yeah. even come after it. Right. Right. No, not unless they, not unless they're willing to then, well, unless they do the FDR thing, which is what Bob just said, which is the, Hey, we'll buy it from you for $20 and 67 cents an ounce. And then we're going to, uh, then we're going to revalue it at 35 bucks a month later and go through a stealth hyperinflation, which is what we did in 1933. Like, you know, unless they're going to steal everybody's gold and then turn around at 1900 bucks an ounce or just steal it from you and then turn around and revalue it at 50,000, which the, the truth of the matter, that's what they're fighting. So they're not like, none of that is what's going on. They're just going to move right straight to digital script and the full, um, and the full surveillance system. And there's going to force everything else underground, including Bitcoin. If they try. If they go that route, they'll they'll move Bitcoin underground as well. But, you know, to, to the point about, you know, not needing proof of work or anything else to, be, to validate a transaction. I mean, the truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, without an Internet, there is, you know, there isn't a modern society like the, this. We don't have. I mean, so I, I would rather not go back to or, or start positing why we only need physical metal. Because then at that point, we're talking about, you know, an agrarian 18th century or 19th century economy. You know, pre-industrial economy, it, it, under these, uh, under our current circumstances. So, I just think that is not what anybody in power wants to have happen either, because what they want is, you know, their technology, tech, their technocracy running beautifully in order to make, you know, in order to maintain their power, their 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 their, their, their power and their surveillance. So why would they? Why would they do that? So ninety percent of you know the arguments against why you would ever, you know why any of these alternative ways of protecting your wealth it does we're all arguing you know the extreme case that you know that precludes the continuation of society as we even anything close to what we've known and that's just not on i don't think that's on the table unless they're going to just nuke us all and i don't think that's happening either well it, it's important and i tell clients a lot all the time i said what you're really doing is you're putting yourself <clears throat> when you buy gold and silver you're putting yourself on a gold standard yes irregardless of what the, what the government does and, and and by doing that um you know in terms of um whatever the government actually ends up doing um Ultimately, there's a reason why central banks have been net buyers of gold over the last eight years and net sellers of U.S. Treasuries. You've seen 
there, there is a there's a concerted or a concern, I should say, that this whole game, you know, I, I know Bill Fleckenstein, I follow his work. I mean, he talks about this debt jubilee uh, idea um, uh, and no one knows what this thing is going to look like. But at some point, these numbers are <laughs> there's no way they're going to pay this stuff off. I mean, they're either going to just write it off where they're going to inflate it away. Um, but the, the, the problem is to, to service this debt, they need inflation to keep the game going. That's the sad part about this. The, the, the actual thing that would kill the, 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 the system itself would be a dollar screaming higher uh, and then choking out the economy. And then basically there's nothing left to, to, to build because there's no profit margin left. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and then all, all of a sudden, then you have a complete collapse and then you have, then you have a real depression, but, but you know, the system is fighting that. And that's, that's yeah. the reason why I, I own the metals. I mean, it's probably reason p- people buy Bitcoin or, or, yeah, or just, you're absolutely right, Bob. And that's exactly what I'm going to, that's exactly what I'm seeing. I, this, this, what we've done with the sanctions on Russia, you know, uh, since the war started is ensuring that we're going to have massive capital flight into the dollar. And we're starting to see the beginnings of it now. The ends of 125, the, the, the euro, the Lagarde was in there this today, literally propping up the euro to keep it from falling below a dollar eight, six. I mean, there's, you could see it. I was talking to some people who were monitoring the euro ruble market today. And they were like the bid ask spread on the on the, the euro ruble market was six rubles, like the bid ask spread was insane. Jeez. There was definite demand, but there was no supply. And this was on a day when the Russian central bank told everybody, "Yeah, the markets are stabilizing. We cut rates from twenty to seventeen percent. They'll probably cut back to fifteen percent in a couple of weeks, and then you know, and get it as as things get under control." I mean, watching this play out, it's very clear that we've broken fundamental aspects of the global financial system and everybody's trust in what our governments are, are and are not willing to do because they're obviously not there now to protect our rights. They're now there to protect themselves. And that's what we have to be most worried about. That's what I say. So, yeah. and I don't see any, I don't see any other scenario. If this conflict that, that is kinetic now in Ukraine gets worse the where we don't see complete and utter capital flight out of places like Japan, who's just announced that they're going to commit economic harikiri. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> Europe, that's being, that's being, um, that's being, uh, I think, spread eagled by the Russians going to a, a, a gold peg on the ruble on the one hand, and the Federal Reserve threatening to raise interest rates by 3% by the end of the year. Well, how does Europe survive? How does Europe survive that? The answer is they don't. Um, but that's what I'm seeing, and I don't see how I don't see how we avoid the the dollar index at 140 in 18 months or two years. Like that's what I see, and then it collapses. And it, 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 what you just said, then that comes into play. But uh, a dollar index at 140, where the pound, the euro, and the yen all collapse, I absolutely see that. Yeah, it's a scary it's a scary thought because. When you see gold going up with the dollar, um, yep. I mean that that is a sign that you're right. Something is severely wrong in the system, um, and it's not the the, the 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 commodity sector. I think uh, Zoltan Polzar said it. He had a very good interview, which I posted on, on my Twitter feed, uh, talking about how commodities are are becoming more of a central focus now of mm-hmm. of national security for for countries not necessarily you know the the, the redheaded stepchild that is always going to go down when a recession comes um right. because because less people are buying you know the, the treasury market and that and that brings up another point the treasury market you have the mm-hmm. fed that's about to announce 95 uh, you know, removing or reducing their balance sheet by 95 billion a month and you have the U.S. government that's going to, after May, is going to start coming to market with, for, with about a hundred billion a month uh, mm-hmm. of new of new debt debt supply. Who's going to buy this stuff? I mean, it's it is insane to think about how the stock market, the stock market, is going to be able to to hold up under that kind of pressure. Um, uh, it, it, it could be very interesting. <laughs> I, I my theory on this is that the Fed is that the Fed and Congress are mutually trying to blackmail each other into, into changing their ways. I see, a, I see a fundamental shift in Fed policy under Jerome Powell to break the, uh, to break the fiscal insanity on, on Capitol Hill. And 
you know, I've got to ask, you know, who is the person standing behind Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema stopping $6 trillion worth of Build Back Better spending? Because it was somebody. It was somebody who said, no, don't worry about it. They're not going to they're, they're not going to break your legs and they're not going to kill your kids. Because that's where we are. And you know that those threats would have been made. But somebody is standing behind them saying, no, veto this. Say no to these bills. You know, Joe Manchin doesn't doesn't just stand up for six months or seven months and say no about a bill that important to the most powerful people in the world. Because the only way for the Fed, the only way for them to pull off what they're they're asking to pull off is for the Fed to stay at Q eternity. It's the only way. And the only way that happens is if they force the Fed on the fiscal side to have to monetize, you know, an insane amount of debt. And Build Back Better was, you know, when the CBO numbers for the C, uh, for the Build Back Better came out, which is what Manson said he was going to wait for. Yeah, they said, yeah, it's going to cost six and a half trillion dollars. And most of it's going to be in the first, what, three to five years of it. All the spending is going to be up front. Well, guess what? That means it all has to be monetized by the Fed. That's blackmail of the Federal Reserve. I mean, none of us here are, are fans of the Fed. But let's stop and, you know, let's let's ask ourselves, you know, what is going on here? That's pure six and a half trillion dollars worth of fiscal blackmail by an by an, an absolutely insane Congress that, in my mind, doesn't even work for the United States. And so when you're when you look at it from that perspective, when you start really thinking about whose incentives are what here, you have to ask yourself, how did this happen that the Fed, the minute they raised interest rates, on, uh, in in the middle of March, not three days later, they were out there going, you know, that may our, our schedule that we just told you about, that may not be enough. Is now having to accept a uh, the 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 hawk narrative of yeah, we're gonna have to do some fifty basis point raises when Miss M Miss Miss MMT herself <laughs> is saying we have to you know raise by fifty basis points here and there. That's a sign that she has no power within the Fed. She's trying to stay on on side, and that Powell is in complete control and is going and is going to raise interest rates by, by what he said. And what the and the I'm looking at the euro dollar futures curve, and I'm going and they and it still believes that by the end of 2023, the Fed's going to have to reverse its rate hikes, and they, they may be right. It may be right about that, but it's not going to be right about that. Uh, but it it may be doing that from five or six percent, or not three percent. Or three and a half percent, which is why I think it's set, set, pegged that right now. I mean, there's a very, very interesting dynamic that's being set up here that most people are just missing. That I don't think the Fed is down with selling out this, the the rest of the, the, the United States and the commercial banking interests in the United States to Europe and City of London, which is what's going on. That's what Basel III is all about. <laughs> like, like that's what this is all about. This is about bailing out a bankrupt and sclerotic Europe. And this, so I, I, it's very clear to me that, 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 that I've been banging on this point for, for months now. And I'm one of the few people saying it. And finally, I think other, other people are starting to see what I'm seeing. Because the political situation on Capitol Hill is out of this world. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever if you assume that these people work for us. When you assume they don't work for us, everything makes sense. Like you say, they're they're vandals, right, Tom? Yeah, I've been saying this for years that they're mm-hmm. months now that they're vandals. Yeah. So I'd like to go back to something you were you were just saying about the mm-hmm. the euro dollar curve. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a listener of the show sent sent it to me today, and that chart is like horribly ugly. It's just taking a, a nosedive. So what yes. does that represent uh, to you? So when if you look at the euro dollar right. futures curve, and I've been I've been tracking it you know, on a daily basis. And then every, and I, I do weekly, I do twice weekly reports for my, for my patrons on private podcasts. And so twice a week I update what's going on in the euro dollar futures curve. So within the first three days after the fed raised rates by a quarter point, the euro dollar futures curve plunged by 115 basis points. So, you know, Oh, you know, from in the 2023 band, so everything, you know, from January, 2023 and out plunged by over a hundred basis points. So that's telling me that, the um, that the euro dollar markets are being drained dramatically, and that they finally and and now they finally believe that they uh, they're going to need more money than they currently think they're going to need that they thought they were going to need because the Fed's not going to be as as accommodating as they thought they thought right so um, the 
when you when you look at that, that's that to me just says we got a massive amount of stress that some that this market was completely mispriced. All right, so if that's the case, I think now now go now if the offshore dollar markets are in real are, are in real are, are beginning to get into real distress because the Fed has they didn't believe the Fed was was uh, was hawkish had started going hawkish last summer. And they didn't believe that the Fed would actually raise rates until December. Um, now we're in the point where the Fed has already raised a quarter point and is now talking about raising at least, what, uh, another 2% or more by the end of the year, which it never, which now everybody's starting to finally catch up to the idea that maybe the Fed's serious. But the problem is that no one's ever believed the Fed would do so in the past, right? And because, you know, every, every time the Fed has ever tried to raise rates aggressively, it's always then been slapped back down and forced to, 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 um, uh, to reverse itself. Well, the more I think about this, I've been asking myself, well, how is this going to happen? How, how can it happen this time where the Fed actually feels like they have the tools to do this? And maybe they do. I published a, a, an article yesterday about this and asking the big question is, is there a break in the old system? And the whole gold market hasn't the, the community has not touched on this yet. Like we index our debt now to SOFR rather than we index it to LIBOR, right? We always index the LIBOR in the past. And so whenever the European or the London banks started to get into trouble, they blow LIBOR out to the upside, and then that would force everybody's adjustable rate mortgages and, and car leases and everything else, and credit card debt over here would blow out to the upside, even though there was no stress within our banking system. It was manufactured stress because of a blowout in LIBOR. Now, with all the index, all this, the debt in the United States being indexed to SOFR, the secured overnight funding rate, that, that link, that transatlantic link has been broken. If the U.S. banking system is in better shape and the U.S. economy is in better shape than uh, Europe is, then when the Fed raises rates and drains the overseas dollar markets, then we're going to see stress build up quickly overseas, and we're seeing that in the euro dollar futures market now. Um, and we should be seeing it, and we're beginning to see it in the SOFR versus LIBOR spread. If that's the case, then the Fed's got a lot more room to raise interest rates than they've ever thought that they had in the past, which is why it's so important that they that Build Back Better didn't get passed, because now there's no, there's, there's no way to attack the Fed from either LIBOR or from, uh, from Congress that's profligate and trying to spend this into debtor's prison. And when you ask yourself, qui bono, who benefits from blowing out LIBOR to the upside and who benefits from $6 trillion worth of un spending we don't need? It is in the United States. What you're trying to do is keep cap what they're trying to do is keep capital from fleeing Europe. So everything I just said about the, I, I, I can see a dollar index at 140 because if Europe collapses and the, the euro starts to go towards parity, or lower, and we actually get real expression of what the risk is to hold euros in the euro, uh, uh, the euro debt markets, the euro sovereign debt markets. Like we actually start to see real price discovery over there. Um, yeah, trillions of dollars of capital are going to flow across the Atlantic over here, and it's going to blow, and it's going to, it's going to send the dollar to the moon, and that's going to give the, the Fed even more cover to raise rates. And you know, at the same time, the whole global South, I see is starting to get off the dollar in terms of trade. Now you've got dollar you've got hundred you got trillions of dollars or you know hundreds of billions of dollars in Benjamin sitting overseas in emerging markets. They don't know what to do with this stuff. They're gonna start disgorging them now because they don't need them. Because they're gonna start doing more trade locally. So the Fed also has to be able to sop up the excess liquidity coming out of those markets. So I can see all of this playing out over the course of the next two years where it looks exactly like what I just described. Uh, the the and and by the way, at the same time, gold would have to rise as well, because as the uh, as interest rates rise here, the fiscal position of the United States is going to drop like a rock. It's going to de deteriorate like a rock. Everybody's confidence in the U.S. is going to drop like a rock, and people are going to rush into gold and silver and other commodities because for the same reasons. And it's a replay of the 1970s all over again. Now the bigger question is: Can we actually get a Congress that will cut spending by 30 percent? Which is exactly what needs to be what needs to happen under this scenario for the for the U.S. government to not default in 2025. For 
say. That's the way I, I mean, it's a big thing I just laid out for you, but I, but think of it in, but think about what I just said. And it kind of all makes a lot of sense. I'm, ha- I'm happy to have people air check this to hell and gone. Cause I, I, if I'm right about this, ugh, well, you know what to do by gold, um, <laughs> by Bitcoin. Cause those things are going to go to the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, it's going to be crazy. And I don't know if I'm right. I mean, again, I don't know if I'm right or not, but this, this is what it feels like to me, like laying all this out. So well, go for it, pick it apart. Yeah, part of this is, I mean, it's, a, it's the whole thing. You're muscled, coffee. Bob. Oh, sorry. Am, am I a little bit better right now? Yeah, yeah. you're good now. Okay. Um, part of, I mean, this whole game, it's a confidence game. But what, what I find interesting is in, in t- February of 2021, when when the bond market was breaking down from from the August 20, uh, 2020 high, um, and, and that's when gold topped as well, um, you had – the, the the primary dealers, which were were heavily heavily leveraged, um, you know, they were losing money, and and the, the the basically the Fed and the Treasury came up with this idea of of re or buying, I guess, redeeming the T bills or 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 um, uh, buying back the T bills uh, and and um, uh, uh, um, Sorry, lost my train of thought there. Um, ba- basically, uh, buy, the, the buying back T bills um, uh, and then taking that cash and flooding it into the market. Uh, and at the same time, the Fed had created this reverse repurchase program to sop up that liquidity. Um, so that was a so called floor of interest rates that they were creating because of. Uh, um, you know, they were still doing. Fed was still doing QE, and the, and the and the and the government was still borrowing money. But but what's interesting is there was a, almost a one-to-one correlation with the rise of this re- reverse repurchase program from February t- 2021 to today, um, with the amount of redemption of of short-term T bills by the U.S. government. Um, but but when the the T bill market when the Fed start or sorry the Treasury started issuing T bills again, everyone thought that okay this reverse repurchase program which grew to like one point nine trillion dollars in December, um, a lot of that money is finally going to start getting unleashed and going back into the market whether it's money market accounts whatever it may be, and that should put a bid into into uh, U.S. Treasuries. Um, well, what ended up happening was. Um, some of that money did leave the reverse repurchase program, but most of it stayed. In fact, their program, I think it's 1.7 trillion or something like that. It's, it hasn't really budged at all. And people, money markets and insurance companies, pensions, institutions, whatever it may be that have their, 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 they feel more comfortable lending the money to the fed than they do the U S treasury themselves. And that, that's kind of an interesting confidence play on the the system itself and part of it could be because you know they're anticipating the fed to raise rates so therefore the 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 rate of return they're going to get on the reverse repurchase program is going to be almost correlated one for one with whatever they raise interest rates with versus the treasury market Mm -hmm. which could be affected by collateralization and all that kind of stuff but but i just you're not seeing the the problem there's there was a massive dirt collateral during covid because everybody saved all their money. The, the, the savings rate in the United States went to 33%. Like the Fed first starts freaking out when the, when the savings rate gets above seven. So when that happens, remember, your savings is the bank's liability. So in order, if they can't lend and can't put new loans on the books because there's no economic activity because everybody's locked in their homes, then the, the RRP facility was used as a way to get collateral, treasury. Money, good treasuries to stick on their balance sheets as collateral against all the savings. And the better question is now that the savings are starting to drop, but people are still the, the banks are still holding um, those that, that collateral, as you just said, um, because they they can still get uh, a rate of return on that money. They can still get a positive uh, uh, rate of return on that money. And, and the, the other thing that 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 the reason why Powell raised the RRP facility to five basis points. There's two reasons he did it. One, personally, I think it's because he was now beginning the process of draining the overseas um, Europe, uh, dollar markets. But at the same time, money market rates in the United States had effectively gone to zero. 
And he didn't know how far below zero they actually were because they would never go below zero in nominal terms. But there was latent demand, right, which was pushing overnight money down below, down negative. And we couldn't have that. So he raised it to five basis points to uncover the latent demand. Jeff Snyder wrote a great article about that, about that, uh, when that when he did this right after the June 16th meeting last year. Uh, and, it, and when he did that, the, the, the overnight money, money market rate went back to three and a half basis points. So there was a one and a half basis point worth of latent or you know, unexpressed demand in the marketplace. So you could say that you know, on the day of that, that, that uh, um, re, the, the, the rate raise, that the actual money, the actual demand would have, people would have been willing to borrow at negative 1.5 basis points in the U.S. dollar, in the overnight market. That's how, that's how crazy things were. But, um, but once he did that, it was clear that they, this, people didn't have anywhere to put their money. And they're like, they're happy to like, you know, you know get a treasury bond from the Fed and you know, get five basis points and, and loan it back to them in, in, revert, in, in, in reverse repo. And then the other thing, they, did, did anybody notice last year that the Fed also created a foreign repo facility? So mm-hmm. right after he drained all this, this money from overseas markets, he then turns around and creates a foreign repo market so that he can give them dollars when they need them. So he can bring collateral so you can repatriate treasuries, <laughs> right, from overseas and give them dollars and then turn around and, you know, lend the treasuries back out to the banks through the reverse repo facility um, and take dollars under with, on, under their balance, on, under with balance sheet. You, you, you see the, what he did there? It's like it, it, it was very clear to me, like he had all the he put all these tools in place that completely have fine tuned control over global dollar flow. Which he did, which I don't think the Fed's had in the past. And you know, when you follow Snyder's argument about the euro dollar markets being the real setters of monetary policy, where the Fed was basically always the the price taker as opposed to the price maker on its own money, then what Powell's done over the last year and a half is to reverse that completely, or the last four years with the advent of SOFR, is to reverse that completely. And now the Fed, for the first time in fifty years, is actually the price maker of its own money. Which is then going to pull, force Congress into a fiscally um, hawkish position. Like they're they're, they're going to they're, they're gonna have to be fiscal hawks now, whether they like it or not. And I, to me, that just screams that the commercial banking system in the United States was not interested in in going that gently into that good night. Like because you know Klaus Schwab and the WEF they want to get rid of the commercial banks. Like it's the only thing that makes any sense to me. Like the, everybody's incentives line up here. So this is this is the way I see it. And I don't you know, again, I, I, I don't know if I'm right, but it just feels like that's where we are. So and then gold is, you know, trapped in the middle of this as to who is it? Who is, you know, who's eventually going to let gold out of the box or is gold just going to let itself out of the box? And, you know, to your points earlier about the the, the gold market moving away from a, a an, an over levered high rehypothecated derivative market where everybody's just trying to hedge their dollar risk with gold and they don't really care about taking physical delivery to a much more physical delivery market, then eventually we're going to get to the point where physical gold will be the price maker and the derivative contracts will be the price taker. And we might get, we may, and I think the Russians are trying to force that onto the market right now. So Tom, as, as part of your kind of thesis here, mm-hmm. um, when we think about the, the Fed raising rates, Mm-hmm. And we know that um, each 100 basis point or, or percentage point of interest rate that they, that they raise, they have to somehow come up with another 300, I, I believe it's something yeah, like $300, $300 billion, billion dollars to service the debt. That's just yep. to pay the interest on the debt. So yep. where, where do you think that ceiling becomes or does, you know, in, in some ways, does it not matter because we can just print slash borrow I, 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 it I into it ad infinitum? I mean, yeah, no, I mean, that's the point that Luke Groman makes all the time, like, and, and, you know, to speaking basically encounter to what I'm talking about, that they can't raise too far. And I know a lot of people make that argument. I'm not saying that they're wrong. They're not wrong. It's, it's a reality. We got to pay $300 billion. This is why I'm arguing that we're going to have to start the process of signaling to the markets that we're not going to spend like drunken sailors anymore, that we're actually going to live within our means, that Biden is never going to be able to pass a $5.85 trillion budget, you know, with a one and a half trillion dollar deficit. You know, in a, in a world where the United States, where the, where the dollar is, you know, 
slowly by degrees, by a death of a thousand cuts, not a death of a thousand cuts, but you know, that the dollar reserve or the trade system of the, of the world no longer necessarily has to run almost exclusively on dollars. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to mean someone is going to have to come in and stand up and go, you know what? No. And I think that's why we look to the midterm elections to see how, how the Republicans, you know, how many real fiscal hawks new a, a second tea party comes in and says, you know what? No, we can't do this. And if it means that we have to, you know, cut back on, you know, entitlements and military spending and whatever we have to do, then we do so. But this is what has to happen. And I don't know that that's politically palatable enough, but I can tell you that I think there's a, I, I think we're at a point in this story where the millennials who are behind me, because I'm Gen X, the millennials know they're, they're screwed. No one my age or younger really believes they're going to get Social Security in any, any, any appreciable amount. So, you know, we have the window to reform Social Security. We have the window to reform, you know, Medicare and all the other things that we're, we're spending unbelievable amounts of money on. And it, this is where it comes down to. Do, does no one, the, the, the argument I'm making here is that I, I hear all the time, well, the Fed can't really raise rates much past 1%, otherwise everything will collapse. Well, no. If we pledge to three to $500 billion worth of spending cuts, well, then that's the first, <laughs> that's the first percentage point. And we're mm-hmm. status quo is where we are today. And if we pledge to that, do you think the market's not going to reward us for this? Do you think the markets, you know, do you think capital markets are not going to want to come in and, you know, invest in a, in a United States that's not acting like, you know, <laughs> an idiot? Powell himself came out and said, you know, there's room for more than one reserve currency in the world. Right. So, I mean, we don't have to live in Trippin's paradox forever. We don't have to do we don't have to do this. If we don't want to. But we have to signal to the market that we're willing to that we're willing to do that. And I think if we were to do that, especially with a collapse of the European Union, politically and financially, um, that the, the, uh, the, the runway will be there for that to happen. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if we continue to, to, to try and stoke World War III, well, then no. And it doesn't really matter. It's all going to blow up. And then you definitely better have some gold and silver at that point. So. Yeah, it, it it kind of seems like no matter what the outcome is here and every scenario that I've kind of looked at, it's the, the analogy that I've kind of come up with uh, myself was that we need a bunch of buckets, a bunch of different buckets to kind of catch some of this liquidity that the Fed, the Fed is just kind of spraying all over the world. So mm-hmm. gold, silver, Bitcoin, um, you know, some tangible assets. It doesn't seem totally. like you're ever going to be worse off to to have some of those. Yeah, no, um, that's the way. I mean, that's the way the that's the way I, I've been advising my people for five years now, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you look at our portfolio and within you know within gold, goats, and guns, we're we're talking about I've got exposure to land, of like I've got exposure to things like timberland and farmland. I've got things. I've got exposure to commodities. I've got exposure to gold and silver. I've got exposure to cr- cryptocurrencies, both proof of work and DeFi style proof of stake. I'm not I'm not averse to those things, um, and you know. At, and just, you know, good, solid businesses that don't have any uh, debt associated with them. And I don't even like gold miners that are carrying any debt. You know, I, I like gold miners that have, you know, clean balance sheet, mm-hmm. with, you know, and because that's what you need in this market. Because, you know, otherwise they're just get, they're just a, a nationalization. They're just, you know, a, a nationalization candidate waiting to happen. You know, well, and I, I know that there's th- this last decade has been incredible for gold miners getting back to some sort of you know real disciplined Mm -hmm. operational status and and you know on on one hand that is that is an excellent thing on the other hand it has also provided uh, a real lack of exploration dollars to the space as well sure sure i mean we're in the same problem with the the oil markets in the same problem Mm -hmm. right and you know except except that it seems that all the politicians are really against the oil market, whereas the the gold market doesn't seem to be as as uh, overtly targeted. Yeah, no, you're no, you're right about that. I I, I agree with that completely, Tom. The um, uh, yeah, no, it means that there's a lot of great plays in the gold space that you know weren't there, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago. You know, I mm-hmm. remember 
when I first went to work for Newsmax and was writing the first gold uh, newsletter I was writing for them. I mean, I had a hard time finding, you know, three gold companies that I really liked, you know, because their balance sheets were terrible. They were awful. Like, and, you know, I, I just, I couldn't, couldn't find anything decent. I had to like work really hard to find good, you know, good plays within the space. I wound up having, we wound up having to kill off a gold focused newsletter and turn it into a more general commodities based newsletter in order to, to deal with it. Aside from the fact that it was, a, you know, trying to sell a gold newsletter in a bear market was a bad idea. <laughs> so, um, but you know, we're not in that space today. Um, I, I there's, you know, there's, there's a dozen good gold companies out there on, on top of the ones that I know of. And I barely even cover the space. You know, I don't even really look at the space on a daily basis because I have so many other, you know, ways of looking at this, skinning this cat. You know, mm-hmm. my, my goal at this point is to teach people how to evaluate a gold company and then go out and find good ones and then tell me, you know, and say, hey, why don't you, why don't you recommend this one to us? Because well, I haven't had 15 minutes to even look at their balance sheet in the last five years. You know what I mean? But yeah. um, but it's because you can teach people how to fish, then to get, you know you're 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 really doing work. So uh, the the gold industry, what I've seen, yeah, there's a lot of discipline there, and there's a lot of good M and A activity happening. That's the other thing we're seeing. We're seeing high quality smaller producers getting gobbled up by the mid tier producers like uh, Agnico Eagle buying Kirkland Lake, and um, you know who bought Predium? Uh, the Newcrest bought Predium, right? And uh, you know, there's a, a lot of that happening. And I, you know, so uh, we're going to see more of that. We're also going to see a lot of small exploration companies that have been languishing, you know, with good deposits that, you know, are kind of, eh, they're good deposits, but, you know, they're not really all that sexy. But, you know, at $3,000 gold, everything's sexy. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you're going to see, you know, companies that have been sitting around doing nothing literally for seven or eight years are going to get bought. And put into production, um, and uh, we're going to see a lot of that. I think, you know, 2023, 2024, I think that's that's, that's going to happen. It's going to be great opportunities in there. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.